world is changing fast. New technologies are impacting how we think about products, services, and the way we live our lives. Nowhere is this trend more present than in financial services, where new business models and customer expectations are changing our conceptions about banking, finance, and the very nature of money. Welcome to Rebank, a visionary podcast about banking, fintech, and the future. The future of banking is here. Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Welcome to Rebank. I'm your host, Will Beeson. After working across banking and financial services in the U.S. and continental Europe, I've settled in London, the heart of all things fintech and banking innovation. This podcast is a platform to explore some of the, the ideas, the thoughts, the trends that I find most interesting and, uh, and to get some of the leading thinkers in fintech and banking on and uh, and chat through what's what's going on, what the the implications are likely to be for society, how we're going to see things change uh, in the coming years, both in banking and financial services and and otherwise, um, and and try to draw some conclusions about what this means for for our industry. And uh, definitely reach out, get in touch, tweet at us and the podcast uh, at Rebank Podcast. Look forward to hearing from everyone and uh, enjoy. I think this is a really interesting conversation today. It gets us into some of the high-level trends in data science that are affecting customer experience online, on mobile, and that will have, uh, I think, a pronounced impact on the way that certainly the banking financial services are, are, are delivered. So tune in, enjoy, and give us your comments and feedback at Rebank Podcast on Twitter. Today we sit down with Skylar Lyon, Senior Data Scientist at Accenture. Skyler started his career in data science, working in the defense sector, and has moved across industries since then, working in e-commerce, online retail, travel, and logistics. Skyler's got an interesting view on data science broadly and the way things are moving. I hope you enjoy today's show, and a huge thanks to Skyler for joining. So yeah, great. Let's just uh, dive right in. What are you seeing in data science at the moment? Where is it going? And... Uh, What's the impact for retail banking? You know, obviously that's sort of a multi-part big question, but I'll, I'll try and tackle it in pieces, um, starting with, uh, you know, with regard, with, well, with, with data science generally and where I think it has been sort of over the course of the past several years and now where I, I see it headed and, you um, what I think the implications or impact on uh, retail banking are associated with that. And uh, so basically, you know, I I think that as data science uh, sort of over the past, uh, we'll say five years approximately, has become this uh, very hot um, and hyped uh, trend, um, really the whole idea driving it has been um, personalization and you know how how that manifests itself or or is most commonly sort of um, recognized uh, by the the end user uh, the everyday consumer um, is you know increased uh, relevancy of recommendations uh, that are surfaced and offered um, by uh, providers, whether they are, you know, um, com, uh, cable telco providers, whether they are e-commerce sort of sites, um, or whether they are uh, financial service providers. Um, and so, you know, I think things like the Netflix prize and, um, you know, sort of the more uh, classical study around like Amazon's recommendation engine are two of sort of the headlines that probably most of your listeners um, are, you know, familiar with. And, um, you know, there again, we see this notion of uh, personalization and recommendation through not only, um, you know, inferring your own uh, behavior or or rather your, your, your intent and behavior from your own um, digital traces and actions, um, but also from others. So, you know, 
um, thinking about lookalike models and and approaches like collaborative filtering to say, okay, you know, um, Will is watching uh, action uh, and, and sports genre movies, and Skylar has started uh, watching uh, action, uh, but has not moved over to sports yet. And uh, since they share the similarity in action, you know, uh, we think it'd be appropriate to recommend. Um, something some sports genre to Skylar and so that that's sort of the level of personalization that I think data science has really provided and uh, and brought mainstream uh, over the past five years and you know where I think we are now or where we're headed I, I should say is um, you know it's three things really one is looking at moving from um, and I'll, I'll use some uh, sort of technology terms or ideas here uh, at a very high level. Um, but, you know, th- this idea of moving from um, batch uh, processing to interactive processing, whereby, you know, before those sort of recommendations and those inferences that I mentioned earlier were being computed, uh, you know, maybe at like a nightly uh, kind of level in a batch process where all of sort of the the day's signals have been um, rolled up I- into uh, a database and compute engine, and then that those sort of batch um, transformations and associations and analytics have been run on top. And where we're moving, where we've moved to, is more of this interactive notion. Um, where, you know, before all of that batch processing was happening on, on disks, um, spinning disks uh, for a while there, and then uh, solid state devices more recently. And now, um, you know, as sort of Moore's law has continued to take effect and we see memory prices, um, you know, falling and reaching a level of parity to uh, SSD prices, it's all, um, we're seeing a lot more memory um, basically, this this notion of interactive uh, analytics, visualization, uh, association through in-memory computing, and now you know, so that that has enabled more of this uh, batch style process to uh, support near near real time uh, interactivity. Um, but you know, now we're starting to think um, of we're, we're turning the database inside out, in fact, and saying, you know, that it, it, it's that the the whole database notion and convention um, is inherently flawed, and that what we're really looking at are streams of data, and you know, a stream is really no different than a database uh, in that it's a checkpoint in time of all the data from a, a period um, up to that, you know, checkpoint, presumably now. And a stream is really no different than that. It just has, um, you know, a longer history. And so as um, compute engines uh, have moved toward uh, this notion of directed acyclic graphs and and following um, sort of a graph theory approach toward the operations and transformations on a data set to produce the output, uh, that, along with uh, these streaming technologies, have supported um, more real-time um, streaming analytics behavior. And so what that uh, sort of means and how it manifests itself uh, and will be realized um, by you know end users and consumers and, and passive users uh, is this notion of uh, going beyond personalization to contextualization. Um, and the distinction here being that, you know, now we're moving from saying, okay, well, Skylar, uh, you know, likes, uh, you know, due to our recommendations of, of sports-related um, genres, uh, he, we know that he now has a, an interest in affinities sort of for these, these two categories, uh, action uh, and sports. But, you know, if, if we start to bring in... Um, more dimensions of uh, sort of, you know, my, my favorites being space and time, um, we see that, you know, really it's a matter of context and, and that Skylar actually uh, 
prefers um, unwinding in the evenings uh, when he's on travel uh, through the sports genre, but, um, you know, spends his weekends at home, um, you know, more interested in action. And so then we start to think about, um, you know, your, your always, uh, the, the sensors that are helping provide this contextualization to inform um, models and sort of analytic uh, workflows that, okay, um, you know, Skylar is uh, traveling for work. We, or you know, maybe not for work. We don't know, but um, he he has uh, you know checked in at the airport, and we see that he's headed toward Miami. And there's been a pattern in Fender. I'm traveling to Miami midweek for many weeks now, so we can infer that you know this may be uh, professional related travel. And and so all of a sudden we we start to understand um, sort of the environment or context uh, in which Skyler is uh, you know operating and how that informs his uh, behavior and intent. And this this notion uh, has really been supported by streaming um, technologies and streaming architecture. And so you know I think in near term that is where a lot of the focus of um, data science has has taken us and you start to see things um, in personal assistance like Siri who uh, are now better able to recognize the context um, in which you know the the voice recognition is uh, or sorry the, vo- the voice patterns are analyzed and how that can have a very um, profound uh, distinction between what what is appropriate to respond with, um, and then so you know what I've touched on is this notion of moving from personalization to uh, contextualization. Um, supported through streaming technologies. And then sort of the other piece I see is that we're in this, um, it's almost impossible not for me to bring up now with the craze that is, uh, you know, sweeping the globe. And I I know you uh, personally um, are a fan and, um, you know, user or player or whatever. I'm I'm not sure quite the verb here. Um, or noun uh, of uh, Pokemon Go, but this notion of um, virtual environments and the blending of the physical and digital space. Um, you know, how what we've seen with Pokemon Go is uh, uh, obviously uh, this these augmented uh, reality layers um, overlaid, basically, on... Uh, the real environment uh, in which you interact, and so suddenly, uh, you know, your your physical space uh, it becomes part of this digital world in, in which um, you know the, the gameplay operates in. And I think that we're going to see sort of both as um, AR, augmented reality, and VR, virtual reality, uh, continue to develop. They're still very much in sort of their nascent uh, stages, and and many use cases are are just starting to be fleshed out. Um, But I think we'll we'll start to uh, be supported of this... um, uh, mixed um, reality sort of world where it's it's part uh, virtual, it's part augmented, it's part physical, and it's uh, part digital. And I, you know, again, I I think tying it sort of all back together, this is really where um, you know real time analytics um, and um, and. Um, pardon me, I lost my train of thought there. Someone walked in the room for a second. Um, re- real-time uh, a- analytics and uh, streaming contextualization will really be driving, um, you know, this mixed reality, physical, digital uh, uh, environment uh, that we will be interacting uh, with around us. Um, so that you know that that's sort of the the first two parts um, of the question. So it sounds like meaningful contextual insight requires data from various sources, i.e., Netflix in your example. For Netflix to know that you just checked in to a flight from London, and thereby propose that you watch, I don't know, 
Notting Hill, or better yet, train spotting or something. They need access to your information from your airline app. Does that represent a significant departure from current functionality in terms of cross-platform data sharing, and how would that work? Yeah, you know, it's a great question. Um, I, I think that similar to who sort of the um, turning inside out a, of a database, you know, we're, we're starting to see the um, unbun unbundling uh, of services and then and then even sort of the rebundling um, of services by some of the full stack providers uh, to capture as much of that uh, information as possible. And here I'm talking about more of this sort of uh, push pull battle between you know entities like um, Facebook, Google, uh, Apple, etc. You know where um, I, I think. At, Facebook is, is really trying to be the, the platform on which uh, so much of uh, these apps um, or services are built and provided. But then, you know, Apple uh, and Google through their OSs um, are trying to uh, basically um, shoebox uh, or, or, or rather contain Facebook as much as they can while, um, you know, providing their own services uh, to kind of capture um, a, a lot of that data. But what I think at the end of the day we are seeing uh, is that among sort of, um, I, I think we're, there's a prescriptive uh, top-down unbundling and opening of services and APIs uh, that is really helping drive um, a lot of that data sharing that, that will support the contextualization. Um, and, and you know some of that I think is uh, top down directed by you know government entities and uh, um, I, I for I forget the exact um, term but you know I, I know over in the EU uh, the banks are required to um, basically open their APIs um, in the next couple of years I think you can help me with that one within the next eighteen months. Yeah, and see, so, you know, you're seeing that um, uh, among uh, being driven by government institutions, and I think we're also seeing that being driven by uh, end-user um, desires and uh, sort of the service provider use cases. Uh, so I, I really think that all three um, sort of stakeholders or parties here are working to um, create more of this open data uh, platform and sharing platform, um, while at the same time, you know, there, there is the obvious uh, uh, market um, benefit from sort of protecting the data that you have. So, uh, you know, I think I'm rambling now, but... To your question, I, I think that we do see it supported um, sort of by all the, the key parties here. Uh, while, you know, some may be uh, particularly, may be trying to guard or keep, um, you know, keep, keep their own interests uh, uh, at, at stake. Mm -hmm. You hear a lot of talk in the, the banking space about, um, about privacy, data protection, falling afoul of... Um, of rules and regulations around that can be extremely costly, both financially and in terms of reputation. Uh, it's certainly been less of an issue for most kind of consumer tech, but going forward, if you're, I mean, if we're thinking about data kind of uh, being shared or accessed across apps or platforms, is that is that something that that's going to require, I don't know, user opt-in? Uh, are, 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 there, are there kind of deeper legal concerns around stuff like that? Or, or is that kind of overblown and restricted to, you know, the, the, the banking or, or maybe healthcare sectors? Yeah, you know, I mean, it, and, you know, it, it, thanks for mentioning healthcare at the end because uh, as soon as you mentioned it, I thought, 
the obvious um, other industry where this is uh, especially um, important is healthcare and uh, and HIPAA related um, personal information. And so, yeah, I mean, anytime PII, uh, publicly identifiable information, uh, is enters the picture, um, you know, everyone's uh, security hat uh, comes on and special measures um, are, are put in place and taken to sort of ensure, um, you know, that, that that privacy is protected. However, you know, this obviously has the adverse effect that it, it can limit uh, sort of data sharing and, and lead to siloing um, a lot of this information, which really breaks, uh, you know, and disables this contextualization, personalization uh, uh, idea that, you know, I think so much of data science is working toward. Um, and so, you know, some new ideas have come about in this space, and one of them um, that there was actually a uh, Wired article on um, uh, earlier this month is uh, something that Apple is um, tackling in this space, and it's a notion of differential privacy, uh, whereby your data isn't really associated with you, but rather um, a notion or semblance of you. And so you're basically fed uh, much the same, uh, I suppose, as sort of this idea um, of of spreading risk through a portfolio by, um, well, you know, basically this idea of of capturing a a portfolio uh, to spread risk and sort of decrease the, um, you know, overall exposure uh, here, you know, Apple is thinking about basically bundling um, your data into a, a profile that matches um, other profiles like, like your own and using that uh, richer set that is not tied to uh, any one individual to basically support uh, and, and drive this contextualization uh, and personalization while also not tying any um, direct uh, data back to an individual. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we, I first started seeing um, this idea in actually the defense space, which is sort of the industry where I, I uh, you know, cut my, my predictive modeling data science uh, teeth on. And um, and there, many of sort of derivative products, uh, you could think of those um, as sort of the analytic insights or customizations that are that are provided or offered, could be classified at a low uh, at a level lower than the data, so long as it wasn't um, you know immediately. Uh, tied back to the data. So really what, what, what was being protected there was the data and many derivative products um, were more, um, you know, were, were classified at, at a lower level and therefore more easily uh, spread, uh, kind of breaking these silos. Um, and so I think, you know, this is a powerful idea that we will see uh, in forming and shaping the banking landscape, um, whereby we can, um, you know, a- again, uh, decouple sort of the, the data and the informed um, um, products from that, uh, decouple that from the individual themselves. And so, sure, obviously, you know, anytime we're looking at a transaction, um, you know, the, the parties will uh, need to be clearly identified. But even then, you know, through technologies like blockchain and such, we've found ways to better um, anonymize or secure e- even sort of those entities. And so really, I, I think we see this being kind of tackled from uh, multiple angles. One, where we're improving the, um, or, or rather, I, I should say, where we're stripping out the uh, personally identifiable information of an individual um, and making that more secure and anonymized um, while at the same time increasing the power that um, we can th- the power in which we can operate and derive these products f- 
from an individual without linking uh, back to the individual or their data, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so you sort of see multiple ways about tackling the, this security problem. To the, the point about Apple and their differential privacy strategy, I guess a lot of financial analysts are concerned that that will over the long term be a limiting factor in uh, Apple's future growth, whereas Facebook and Google seem to openly espouse uh, kind of the, the, the more traditional access to, to identifiable information. Do, do you have a view there, uh, both in terms of whether it will have a limiting uh, impact on, on Apple and its ability to, to do interesting things in the future, and also whether it's kind of from a, from a social standpoint, uh, people will, will, will take a view as to whether Apple is doing the right thing or, or Google is? Yeah, so, you know, very, very interesting question. Um, I, I think largely we need sort of uh, both sides of the coin. Um, you know, I, I think uh, deeply embedded in both of these uh, companies' cultures and, and very sort of ethos is, is their notion of um, how, how sort of the, the full stack uh, should be Provided whether it's a, a closed system, uh, a la Apple, um, where you run our software on our hardware, um, and we sort of, um, you know, very tightly control uh, everything around that, or whether it's a la Google, um, who has you know opened their OS and, and doesn't even produce hardware, um, and you know has tried to. Uh, remain as open as possible, both in their app store uh, and just sort of uh, general style. Um, and I think that what we can even tell from, you know, what um, analysts like Benedict Evans from uh, Andreessen Horowitz has, has said that, you know, both, both won that game, uh, at least with regard to um, mobile adoption and sort of where we're at right now. Uh, we, we really need both sides of the coin because um, they advance the technologies in complementary ways and, and sort of show what's possible from two different angles and, you know, allow, um, allow proponents of both sides to really sort of test, test their hypothesis and, and let it play out. Um, so, you know, I... I, I think that um, I, I don't see it hurting uh, Apple's position uh, in sort of the, the short term, um, and and even really the long term. I think that we we need both approaches here. Uh, I think that similar to, similarly, um, individuals, uh, you know, as as societal um, notions and, and I. Uh, uh, ideas around what is appropriate change. Uh, we, we'll need to be supporting sort of all, all, um, all uh, ideas along that that spectrum. Um, from you know someone like myself who wants to basically provide as much um, sort of relevant data as I can to various uh, providers such that my experience is uh, customized, uh, you know, as best as possible um, to, you know, some, some other individuals who put a lot more, um, uh, you know, emphasis on their own sort of privacy and security for whatever reasons, you know, that I, I'm not judging or, or, you know, <laughs> bringing into the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that anywhere along that spectrum of, of open data versus um, sort of uh, privacy and protection um, are going to be necessary as we, you know, sort of forge this path forward and, and see what what makes the most sense um, and sort of uh, help society um, greatest. Coming back to one of the, the concepts you were talking about earlier as, as potentially a way of, um, of wetting our appetites for a, a part two, how might contextualization be applied to banking to, to improve the value or the experience that, that users get? 
Yeah, well, so, you know, a couple ideas here. Uh, one, I, th I think that um, traditional sense of risk scoring at this point has been, uh, ha has really been proven as inadequate. Um, you know, the, the way to uh, get credit is to have credit, and um, how, how do you kind of hop in this loop uh, for the Side, especially if if sort of a traditional signal uh, indicates perhaps that, that that you may carry risk, um, where you know I think that more um, than ever previously available, there are some alternative signals. You know the the classic um, sort of story here is uh, looking at. Um, individuals graduating from sort of top tier universities, and and there's a lot of uh, confidence there statistically um, proven out through uh, you know many years of data now that these are very low uh, risk candidates uh, for sort of uh, financial risk um, and, and defaulting and such. And so while they may not have uh, sort of a, a credit uh, track record, uh, you know, the, these individuals are um, presumably or rather are, are safe to uh, provide uh, loans to you know so already we're seeing uh, that many of sort of the traditional frameworks and models um, are kind of being questioned and and proven uh, if not wrong at least not as uh, strong as some more um, competitive sort of uh, approaches and and models uh, that now better sort of capture this this uh, new data these new data that are available um, and you know so moving from that to you know what I, I think the lands where where I think the landscape will be headed it, it's sort of this notion of right size right time um, and in that case what I mean is that you know, at any given point, uh, lines of credit, whether they be uh, informal sort of, um, you know, can you spot me uh, conversations between two friends grabbing a lunch at a deli, uh, or whether it is, you know, going to a uh, um, an established, uh, you know, sort of classically um, marble pillared, heavy statuesque uh, banking institution, and 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 asking for a business uh, loan. You know, I anywhere in between that, I, I think that what we want to see is that um, that the timing is right and the sizing is right. And you know, even in my little example of can you spot me, um, I think that. You know, a, a notion of a, a micro bank could be provided here, such that um, you know, and and in many ways, this is the idea of what a credit card is. But suddenly, we take uh, the credit card um, agency out of the picture, and their you know their uh, um, uh, the, their annualized return rates out of the, the picture, and we have a service that. Uh, you know, any shop, for example, could uh, provide um, that says, uh, hey, you know, you have um, a sense of a digital identity and it has a, a trustworthiness score associated with it. And don't worry about um, the payment because that will all just sort of uh, be processed without anyone really um, knowing and in, in as frictionless a way as possible. And, and so really what I see and how I see this landscape changing is right size, right time to passive, um, to passive participants. So it might not even necessarily be that... Um, you know, uh, that that individual knew they needed um, some financial service in that moment. But, you know, I think some of the providers uh, might be able to, uh, similar to sort of the, this creepy idea um, that I think Target had uh, where they could identify in many in, in s many cases uh, th that a, um, a female... Uh, was pregnant before maybe the, the female themselves knew. Um, similarly, I think, uh, you know, financial services products will be provided um, 
around helping people before they know it, whether that's uh, prevent some sort of, um, you know, whether that's a, a reshuffling of assets to prevent um, uh, some some fees incurred that might just be sort of automa- automatically happening uh, on the back end without them necessarily being aware. And this is what, what I mean by sort of this passive participation um, and, uh, you know, so you could see an example of that um, or something, um, and actually I just looked at the time uh, and need to cut soon uh, or, you know, momentarily. But, um, you know, this, this idea of right, uh, right size and right time, and I think that, that a lot more passive participation uh, will, will be sort of driving the um, next generation of uh, financial services. Um, that that consumers uh, will be experiencing. Skyler Lyon, a data scientist from Accenture, thank you very much for your time. We'll uh, we'll do it again sometime soon. Hey, thanks so much, Will. This is such an interesting conversation that I think we'll do a round two sometime soon. We got into some interesting topics today, but I think there's a lot more to flesh out. In fact, I'm sure the topic of data science is one we'll, we'll come back to with some regularity. Thanks for listening, and thanks very much to Skylar Lyon, Senior Data Scientist at Accenture, for joining us. Hopefully we can get him back sometime soon for a round two. Check out Skylar on Twitter, at SkyHigh, S-K-Y-Y-H-I-G-H, and give him a shout. Thanks for tuning in to ReBank. If you like today's show, reach out. Follow us on Twitter at ReBank Podcast and join the conversation. For more on banking, fintech, and the future, check out our regular content at www.bankingthefuture.com.